Hello, my name is Elena Lazarus. I am a research chemist working in the Department of Plant Biology at the Carnegie Institution for Science in Sue Ree's lab. And I'm also one of the organizers of this event today. And I'd like to uh, extend a, a warm welcome and sincerely thank you all for joining us for our pilot event. We created this event because uh, science and technology is impacting everybody and, and in all ways in our life. And we wanted to create a, an avenue and a venue for people to come and interact with scientists and industry professionals in a very casual manner and uh, over, over movies, because we're all movie lovers. And I think with that, I'd like to introduce one of my team members, Seba, who's going to be moderating this event. Thank you all for joining us. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Seba. I'm a first year graduate student here at Stanford studying plant biology, uh, and I'm particularly interested in agriculture. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the film. If you haven't had a chance to see it, your free copy is still available uh, until tonight at midnight. Um, so just a few rules about how the questions will be handled. So questions uh, that were submitted through registration or emailed, uh, they have been queued up for, for me. So I'll be uh, giving them to the panelists. Uh, if your questions were submitted uh, in the registration survey after 2.30 p.m. Pacific time, uh, they should be reiterated in the chat. We didn't get a chance to uh, go through those. Audience members can submit uh, questions in the Q&A during the event, and we will try to get through as many as possible, but uh, and may reword questions if we get multiple about the same topic, because we had over 100 questions. So this is uh, there's gonna be a lot of questions. And the audience members uh, will never be unmuted or on camera. So please use the Q&A function. And we're going to record this. Uh, so uh, this is going to be released pending approval of the panelists. And then I would just like to uh, start introducing the panelists and see if they would like to say something about themselves. So we can get started with Brittany. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I am a, an assistant cooperative extension specialist with um, University of California, Davis. I specialize in agricultural economics. Um, so I do a lot of my research and extension um, in the areas of looking at risk management for agriculture. Um, so I've, I've researched and, and done extension on a lot of different topics, um, some on organic agriculture, I've done a lot on pollination services, contracts, um, some, a, a lot of research on almonds. Um, I'm, I'm originally from Iowa. <laughs> um, my grandparents have had a farm um, for a long time, and now my dad and, and uncle are um, helping my grandma since my grandfather passed away a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, I come from a, a farm background to some extent, and yeah, I'm really excited to be on this panel today. All right, cool. John, would you like to say something about yourself? Hello. Hi. Um, my name is John Chester. Um, I feel like if you've watched the film, you've probably heard enough from me. Um, I'm really happy to be here and um, look forward to um, hearing some of the questions. All right, um, so let's get started with some questions. So something that came up in a lot of questions is people are interested in, in knowing uh, what do you see as the future of farming in the next five to 10 years? Is that directed at anyone in particular? Yeah, you guys can feel free to answer. John, you can go ahead and go okay. first. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Um, the future of farming in the next five to 10 years, um, uh, I mean, just from my own you know, worldview and the microcosm that, that I have, have experienced, um, I would say that uh, those you know, really willing to embrace the innovative side of, of what agriculture can do to align with the scarcity of you know, finite resources uh, especially here in Southern California, that being water. Um, and, and I think those <clears throat> willing to um, really take the, 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 the deeper view and the longer view on the economic return of farming when it comes to soil health. Um, because in a lot of ways, uh, those of us who have, you know, higher levels of organic matter and biodiversity on farms, you know, can, can sustain some of the um, 
climatic events that, that, that we're experiencing much differently than, than farmers that um, maybe haven't been paying attention to some of those things. So I, I really think the five to 10 year view is, 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 is really going to be owned by those that, that see the advantages there and also understand the connection to nutrient density and the generative diseases. Yeah, I mean, I think that was a really great answer, John. And I think it's uh, sort of similar to what I see um, as well. It's it's like we see the effects of, of climate change a lot here in California um, with the wildfires and drought. Um, and so I think that the agricultural industry is really going to start seeing um, some of these changes happen and they're going to have to really be proactive in dealing with them. So um, actually I was just back in Iowa, um, I guess it's been a couple months ago now, and I was really excited to see that a lot of the farmers there um, have been planting cover crops um, in Iowa, which is um, not, it, it wasn't something that happened when I lived there, um, you know, a number of years ago. So, and, and a lot of that's being driven by, you know, some of the policies that are out there and, and incentives for planting cover crops. And so I think we'll definitely see a lot, of, a lot more focus on soil health because it really is just going to mitigate some of the risks um, that farmers are dealing with, especially here in California with the lack of, of water, reliable water. So yeah, I think, I think I agree with John on that. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, next question. People are interested in knowing if polyculture farming is feasible on a global scale. I think um, the, 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 probably the better way in my view to, to answer that would be to say that I don't think that anything that you know, any farm does should be prescriptive. Um, I think the thing that is going to be feasible on a global scale is the view that um, soil health and biodiversity um, is, you know, primary to the building of a farm's immune system. And once you understand the things that you need to do on your farm to enhance the biodiversity of both above the ground and below the ground, um, then the methodologies are really informed out of that and um, the kind of farm that, that farming experience that, that you want to live. So I, I think uh, there, it does have come up a lot after people watching the film saying, you know, can, can, is that scalable? Can that be, you know, can that be done anywhere? And the, the short answer is the, the lens used to develop this farm can, can be done absolutely nearly anywhere except for the two places that uh, Richard Branson and the other guy from Amazon want to take us. Um, it would be a little more difficult there. Um, so I, I think that's what, I, what gives me a tremendous amount of hope is that we don't have to get down into the minutia of methodologies. We have to just um, a line around at least a way of seeing um, the, the future potential of what it takes to harness the power of, of an ecosystem and the resiliency of that ecosystem. Yeah, I think, I think you make a lot of good points, John. Um, so th the way I sort of think about this question is, um, I guess just thinking about why we got into this place of monoculture crops in the first place. And really it, it's all about, I mean, what economists um, call, you know, efficiency and returns to scale. And so, you know, the farmer, a farmer saw that, you know, it's, it's much more efficient to have, you know, a large amount of, of almonds because you have all of the equipment and the machinery and then you just take them and, and it costs a lot less to harvest and um, to produce those almonds. And so I think it's, yeah, so there, there are definitely some things that it, it's, we've gotten really used to in the US, our food system just being there and being able to go to the grocery store and get, um, you know, pears in December or something like that. And so we've gotten really used to this cheap 
or not cheap, but um, low cost food system uh, that not all other countries necessarily have. Um, and so it's going to take a lot uh, to get away from that. And we have still, you know, a growing population and a lot of, of mouths to feed. And so it's really about using our scarce resources in a way that we can, we can do that. And, you know, we can feed the low income um, people in America and, and feed them healthy foods that are a sustainable um, supply. So I think it's, it, it will be interesting to see, you know, how, because I feel like the research is still going on about how we can use some of this regenerative agriculture and can it replace conventional farming? I think the question is still, is still really out there and there's, there's a lot of research to be done around that topic. Yeah, that ties into another question that the people had. It's like, as a consumer and voter, what can I do to support environmentally responsible agriculture? And what can we do indoors in our homes or easy changes we can make to our everyday life? Um, should we just continue with this? Me, me first, you second? Sure. Oh, that's unfair. <laughs> go for All right, it. next time you go first. All right. Um, <laughs> So I think, you know, I, I think that's a great question because I think there's so much passion around this. And, and I got to tell you, I have a lot of hope um, for where we are. I, I don't see it as uh, us in such a dire situation as uh, I think we were worse off back in the 60s and 70s and 80s when we were trying to introduce the idea of, of organics. Um, I think the cumulative embracing of uh, regenerative agriculture by so many young people. Um, I have people showing up here in third grade that know more about soil science than I did when I was 30. Um, and so what, what I see is this, this, this movement of people really starting to identify that the, the nutrient density of the food is related to their health. Their gut microbiome is their immune system. The soil microbiome is the immune system of the, of the plants. And therefore the planet. And, and really the way for them to empower this movement is through their own purchasing decisions. Um, and when they can, um, because there are so many young farmers that you know I've gotten to meet and aspiring farmers that want the opportunity to do this. And their parents who may have been farming third, fourth generation farmers will tell them, well, no one's gonna buy that. And then they kind of give up because that's what the perception is from generations before, that there isn't that support. And that's just actually not true. It's actually changing. So I, I think between how you support agriculture uh, will change policy, it will change the big companies and it'll change large scale agriculture, you know, because large scale agriculture answered the call of inexpensive, cheap, whatever food. And um, so did Monsanto. They answered the call of how to make that food as cheaply as possible. They weren't invented first, you know, and then the request. The request kind of came first. We want our food cheap. Um, so I think the opportunity is there for people in the way they buy. And then I think in the homes, honestly, it's gonna be, it took us 260 years to get into this problem. You know, the last 80, if you just say like from the time that grocery stores started up here. Um, but, you know, since the industrial revolution, it's been 260 years. We're not gonna get out of it in one generation. And I think it's re it, 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 there's a lot of anxiety where how do we solve this now? How do we fix it all? And I think if we can just not throw away the finite natural resources in the form of the food scraps that we don't eat, if everybody in, in the United States, everybody in New York City just collected the compost and were able to deliver that to some sort of um, roadside pickup and those finite resources were available to the future farmers that want to actually farm in this way and have the non-synthetic version of nitrogen and other nutrients to choose from and more efficient versions of actually nitrogen, um, then that is going to get us a lot further into the world of sustainability so that our, my son and other people's children's children have at least a foundation and that soil. So, I mean, I think the goal of this generation should be to put things back into the soil that they're not eating. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> that was a really great answer. And I'm not sure that I, you know, have that much to add to that. I mean, I guess the one thing that I sort of, of think of, and I feel like I've kind of been harping on this already, but it's, it's just like John said in that as consumers, you know, we sort of, of shape 
the way that agriculture, um, it, you know, the way that our food is produced and, and you do that by, you know, your purchasing patterns in the grocery store. And so I feel like what is, is something we need to keep in mind is, you know, we, <laughs> I feel like a lot of times, you know, conventional large scale agriculture gets sort of demonized when we start talking about sustainability and organic food. But the reality of it is the, the people behind that conventional agriculture are trying to, you know, create a life for themselves as well. And, you know, they're not doing things that <laughs> that are going to be damaging to their land or damaging um for their future, because a lot of times these, the land is passed down to their, their children. And so I think it's, it's important for consumers to, to sort of keep that in mind that, um, you know, we can really impact how our food is produced. Um, and that it's not, you know, conventional agriculture versus organic, like we should be sort of working together to get everyone on board to do these, you know, practices that improve soil health, like cover crops or composting. Um, and, and that way, you know, our whole food system is, is sustainable as a whole, not just, you know, different sectors of it. I like that answer. I'm just going to add one thing to that. I, I, I agree. I think there's this, there's this notion that in order to change it, we have to, you know, we have to shame farmers. And sure, are there some farmers out there that um, maybe don't care as much about the environment as we wish? Absolutely. But there's, I have some neighbors back in suburbia where, where I grew up in Maryland that didn't care about the environment worse than any farmer. <laughs> but it, it's not going to, I, I think you, you, we can, we've learned already that we can't force people uh, to change the way they act and the way they think um, by using fear tactics and laws alone. Because once the laws go away or the fear subsides, they go back to acting and, and thinking the way they did before. And the thing that I've sort of been affected by and I've watched and as a storyteller watch is that the, if you really wanna change the way people think and act, you focus on giving them new ways to see. You, you help connect the dots for them in in a, in, in a way that they can fall in love with it. And that goes for any, you know, multi-generational farmer too, who, you know, I have a lot of young guys that, and, and women that come here and they want to go home and change their mom and dad's way of thinking. And I'm like, it's never going to work if you, if you try to use the scare tactics, it's just going to create polarity. You have to, you have to start figuring out little things on the farm that are fascinating and connect threads for them, show them how things are connected and it expands from there. And I think, I bring this up to say that the, the group, the individuals on this planet that are easiest to sort of convey that to are third graders. Third graders in the 70s got parents to wear seatbelts. In the 80s, they, they got their parents to stop smoking. In the 90s, they got their parents to recycle, you know? And now here we are, you know, 2021, 22, this is the generation of third graders that will never be able to unsee the ecosystem as an interconnected web that is completely functioning because of the constant state of impermanence. And the contribution they can make to that impermanence is, is through compost. And so I, I really can't emphasize enough that I hope we are, I hope as a culture, we, we focus more on actually giving kids the opportunity to see the way the biosphere actually works um, because that will live on in all the policies that they will one day run um, in, in the future. I just can't imagine how different my life would have been if someone had shown me what I've gotten to experience in the last 10 years. Um, and yeah, I, I just think that, that that to me gives me actually incredible hope, but focus uh, as well. Yeah, um, another question that we have is, do you encounter any regulatory hurdles that preclude you from environmentally sustainable choices you would have otherwise made? Yes, mainly on the um, processing um, because I have a perfectly suitable um, facility 15 minutes away that I could take you know, all of my, my cows, uh, sheep and pigs to 
but because um, they're not a USDA, um, you know, dispatch facility or kill facility, um, I have to drive four hours north. And there aren't a lot of options for us. Um, there's no options organically or humane certified that, that I know of within four hours, three hours. Um, and that makes it really difficult for us to look at, you know, if we had to start making cuts on this farm, um, there's certain livestock elements that, you know, probably wouldn't be our big money makers um, in proportion, but they're a huge contribution source for the, you know, natural resource return. Um, so that's one of the big ones. And I, and I think we have become a little too precious around um, FDA uh, regulations um, on the difference between how this guy sets up his operation 15 minutes down the road versus the guy three, four hours away. I mean, to be honest, this one's cleaner. <laughs> um, but there's an inspector at the other one that never comes out of their office. <laughs> you know, disheartening. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Do you, so do you think that like, what, what kind of changes should occur as like the as department a result of, of that? Yeah. Like the department of agriculture or like the tax code in order to like encourage this sort of like farming. I know there was something called the prime act and I wish I knew more about it. That was up, that was, um, being sort of tossed around for a while. Um, but anything that gives more control to local governments on, um, their ability to sell meat in, uh, the way that meets um, processed within state. Um, also, I think, you know, things like the Cottage Food Act are really important. Like in California, you can make up to X number jars of jam on your farm. Um, things like that are important to maintain um, and to continue to initiate because that's really the future of regenerative agriculture in my, in my experience, in my opinion, is really based on the farm's ability to have a direct relationship with the consumer. So, you know, having to have them ship things off to a processing facility really starts to eat away at 33% or more of their bottom line. Um, and especially in the small quantities that they do. But, you know, and, and I don't think that we're gonna get to a regenerative ag planet because of large scale opportunities within that. I think it's gonna be more of a patchwork quilt because I mean, the reality is, is that there's a, a tremendous number of farms that are, you know, was it 25 acres or less that, less that grow a majority of the food. And I think the opportunity for small scale regenerative agriculture and more artisan based type um, direct, food, direct to consumer um, products is a, is a really in, um, interesting and sustainable incentive for, for young farmers that are, that are trying to do this. So lifting those regulations and I'm sorry I can't be more specific but those are the things that I tend to look for opportunities to kind of go out and support. Brittany would you like to add to that? No I don't have uh, a lot of input on the regulation side of things so. <laughs> okay um, so people uh, in the Q&A are pretty curious about the funding sources that you obtained for the for the farm, they just want to know, like, sort of like the details about like what what sort of like amount of money was like necessary for this sort of thing, and like, is this something that could be a hurdle for some people that are trying to get into this polyculture farming? That's a good question because it it looks pretty pretty extraordinary, and it is. And let me start by saying, um, you know, to to be a regenerative farm hopefully most people know this that have watched it. It doesn't require you to have cows, pigs, sheep, chickens, ducks, all of those things. That, that made for, I mean, a great film and a really difficult life, um, an interesting life, but um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't what was required. I mean, I think you do need a form of animal input um, from some ruminant um, and it helps to have that ruminant on the farm. Um, just for the simple of cycling those healthy microorganisms that are sort of native to your land that sort of intensify those. Um, but I think, you know, when I look at like the total of, you know, expenses of what we did, like we paid, you know, no more than say any other farm that's growing lemons and avocados out here that also has horses on it. It's Ventura County, it, it can be really expensive, but you know, the fencing and all those decisions were decisions that I think were over and above what is required 
when we look back at like what we were spending money on that had the greatest impact, I would say um, unequivocally, it would be the cover crop. We spent $10,000 a year on seed for 200 acres of land. Now that sounds like a lot of money because um, who's gonna sort of see the return on that in three years? But by year five, the amount of water we were sequestering, the amount of nutrients we were beginning to cycle, um, the permeability of our soil for rain events that allowed us you know, to carry that rain event over for months um, is, a, like, is a really difficult natural asset to try to like account for um, and quantify. But and not to mention the predator, the predator and prey relationships between you know, the insects and the predators of the, oh, sorry, the pests and the, and the predators of those pests that live in the cover crop. All of those things over a five to 10 year period really started to sort of monetize to where we weren't spraying you know, $36,000 a year in Asian citrus psyllid sprays. Um, we were spending $8,000 a year on ant bait stations. Once we realized the protector of the Asian citrus psyllid, like an aphid, is an ant. And the Argentine ant is one of the biggest sort of mafia protectors of those, you know, those, those aphids living in the tree in exchange for the honeydew. And people would say, well, we can't afford to spend $8,000, John, on ant bait stations, you know? And I'm like, well, how much are we spending on the sprays to kill the Asian citrus psyllid? What if we just spent the 8,000 on that and let go of the 36,000 in helicopter sprays of not, you know, organic sprays that are like not nearly as effective as the synthetically derived ones. So those were the things that we started to do that I think we had the greatest level of return as well as just like allowing certain native areas of the farm to remain native, uh, let the sages grow, throw a few seeds out and start, you know, allowing uh, the, the uh, Matilda pop poppies and um, the California poppies and um, sage brushes and all the different sort of like uh, pollinator um, habitats that, that we started to see sort of come back here. So that when we cut off the beet, we used to bring uh, 80, to, uh, 80 to 100 rental hives every year on the farm. And by year five or seven, we said, you know what? Let's try to just not rent any hives this year, which is a really scary proposition. And we shut it off completely. And we had no drop in, in uh, fruit that year. We had, um, in fact, if anything, it was just better. Um, and it's because the native bee populations had really sort of come in and sort of started to take over. And so those were the significant sort of like um, investments um, that we made. Here's another one that I find really interesting. Um, uh, gophers, we spent, I mean, I created one of the worst gopher problems in Southern California, by far. Um, we spent nearly $100,000 on three guys full-time for a year on 200 acres of land to trap gophers full-time. And they only caught, and I say only, they only caught 9,000 gophers. I put up 20 barn owl boxes. And by year seven, I had over 90 barn owls cycle through each barn owl box because of the amount of food gophers that were out there produced three clutches, okay? And we estimated based on what the barn owls would eat in that season. And I'm giving you a low number that they ate about 35,000 to 40,000 gophers. So they did $400,000 worth of work. And I spent $1,500 on barn owl boxes. So the thing is, is that there are small investments you make that over time, the cycle of opportunity starts to see and pay off. You, or you start to see it and you start to see it pay off. You just have to think ahead. Alan told me the first month we were here, he said, you need to put up barn owl boxes everywhere. And I'm like, why? He's like, cause you, you know, you're gonna have a gopher problem. And I was like, well, I don't see any gophers, you know? So I just kind of kept putting it off. And there was plenty of other things to do. So it was easy to not come back around to that conversation. When Alan passed away, something like his voice was in my head, like Obi Wan Kenobi, and I, and I was like, I got to put these barn owl boxes up, man. This is starting to get bad. And so I had guys trapping barn owls 
but I wasn't seeing any barn owls. I mean, sorry, trapping gophers, but I wasn't seeing barn owls yet. So it took a while for them to show up is my, is my point. Um, and so I think those, those expenses really showed some real significant return. And I would also say, looking at your farm and being able to do less, you don't have to grow 75 varieties of stone fruit, but you do need varieties to stay competitive as a farm, a small operation. Um, and you know, to have for us year round growing opportunities for the, for the markets. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for that. That really, really interesting. Um, I'm gonna move on to a different topic that people seem to be very interested in. And it's just like, what uh, is the opinion of indoor agriculture, soil free agriculture? And do you think that like having like vertical one level aquaponic structures uh, subsidized in like low income communities should be something that the government should have its hand in? Brittany, you wanna take that one? Uh, this is something that, yeah, I don't, I don't know a whole lot about these types of things um, in terms of what their impact on, you know, energy use would be the big one and like, where are we getting that energy? So how does that impact the environment? But I, I typically, I mean, I think there, it, it could be a technology that, that is very helpful. It's just, um, I, yeah, I don't really have a, a good opinion. I don't know if John has looked more into this at all. In, in fairness, you know, no, I, I haven't. Um, my, my gut assumption or uh, I guess preference would be that we, um, we really take inventory on the benefits that are also indirect benefits of, of farming healthy soil. I mean, carbon sequestration, methane sequestration, um, and, you know, really taking careful study of the, of the, the nutrient density and the nutrient profile of a foods grown in healthy soil versus aquaponics, because, um, I think ultimately at the end of the day, the proof is in really watching a, um, a cultural swing to where they're spending less money on healthcare. And, and a little bit more money on food, which, you know, 50 years ago, it was the other way around. They were spending more on, more on food and less on healthcare. Um, causation, correlation, up, up for debate, but it does kind of follow, you know, the trend of industrialized agriculture and synthetic nitrogen use and um, crop choices that were higher in carbohydrates, maybe, and lower in real, real true flavor uh, and nutrient density. So I would be, um, you know, I'd be, I would be careful of, about it. And it's not something that I would feel would be the federal government's uh, in the, their best interest to um, start funding initially. Um, I think soil health programs like, like that's being done in Maryland, state of California and many others uh, with encouraging cover crop growing and stuff like that is, is really an important first step just because of all the other side benefits that, you know, help clean up, you know, waterways and, um, carbon sequestration and, and all the other things that I'd, I'd mentioned, but, you know, I, I'm biased and, and I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist, so I can't say for sure, um, what, why it would be a bet on a scientific level. And I am a scientist. So that means <laughs> I, I also don't have an opinion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I've seen the research. <laughs> there you go. Right. Smart. Good scientist. <laughs> all right. Uh, what do you guys see as the role of biotechnology in agriculture? And do you think that their uh, genome editing provides a solution for any issues that you might have encountered? Definitely not my area. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is this is obviously quite a, a controversial topic. Um, but I think we have and it's it's. I would say certainly not my area either, but I can I can speak to at least one um, thing that I, I know about, which is there was a problem with, I believe it was pineapple or mango, that could be completely wrong in Hawaii. Um, and basically the solution, they the only solution in their eyes was um, to, you know, do some sort of genetic modification or no, it was papaya. 
Um, and so that completely solved their problem. And now they can produce papaya in Hawaii again. And I could have some of the details of that wrong, but um, yeah. So, I mean, I think in my opinion, there, there may be uses for gene editing in agriculture. I think we're still sort of figuring out, um, you know, what, again, as a scientist, I'm like, we need to see research on what are the impacts of, of these things long-term, uh, which is, is kind of a hard thing to do when, you know, you see you have a problem right now with papaya that's going, you know, you can't produce it and um, you need to fix it in some way or another. And, and so I don't know if that's going to have, you know, some sort of health effect in the future. Um, to me, the science points to it's just a way of speeding up, you know, um, some just, you know, cross pollination and that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think there's, still research to be done on whether it's good or not, in my opinion. Um, I think the research at this point points to that it's not a not a big deal um, and, and that it's potentially a tool in the toolbox for our growers and and a way to produce, you know, food efficiently in an environment an environmentally conscious way. Yeah, just to mention to the attendees that uh, Science and Society on the screen is planning to have uh, some event about the future of uh, genome edited foods. So if you guys want to know more about this topic, we'll hopefully have an event soon about it. Um, I have a couple of questions about specifically about drought. Since we are here in California, people want to know um, what's what are like how best to farm under these circumstances and like the drought seems like it might be getting worse. Like, do you think that sustainable farming needs to be like moved somewhere else, uh, specifically in the context of California? Um, yeah, the, should I, can I, can I go? Yeah, go for it. Right. Um, <clears throat> so the, first of all, you know, it's, it, yeah, I, I feel people ask, they'll say, you know, do you feel like, you know, what you're doing is considered sustainable agriculture? And I think, well, first off, I don't think that word um, is really properly ever been defined. And I think it's pr pretty overused and it creates a lot of assumptions. Like, do y'all remember um, uh, Nature Valley, all natural granola bars? I mean, they managed to fit the word na natural and nature in there. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot really natural in nature about what was going on, maybe the nuts at some point. Um, but the, the idea of sustainability is that like, okay, we got it. This is sustainable. This is going to last forever. And I really think we're at a point where we're, we're really trying to figure out how to just be regenerative to get to a point of true su sustainability. So mistake number one was probably moving 9 million people into the Chaparral area of, you know, Southern California, which is Los Angeles, right? And then you got 9 million people to my south, which is 45 minutes away, 45 minutes to my north, I got like two, 3 million people in Santa Barbara. And then we've got, you know, Ventura County here in the center, growing food, you know, pulling water from an aquifer, um, tremendous scarcity at this point, the water that's beneath the ground, hundreds, if not thousands of years old. Um, and, you know, we're asking about whether or not farming belongs here. Good question. And yet, where does farming belong? because um, we have people living in places that they really shouldn't live that are sucking water from the Colorado River and the Sierra Nevadas. You know, LA doesn't have its own natural water resource that's supporting it. So we're kind of in this, in this together. Um, you know, that said, I, I can't disagree that we should rethink where people live, um, especially given, you know, the, in this idea of a mega drought. Um, but, you know, while we're here, I think, you know, what we've really focused on is try to increase our soil organic matter level numbers. And maybe I'm preaching to the choir and people know this already. So stop me if it's like repeat. But, you know, we did a, a study in the beginning and we had like a 1% uh, soil organic matter level in our soils, which is pretty low. 
Um, and then over this, you know, seven to eight year period, they increased from, you know, that to three to 4%, which in that short period of time is pretty fast. But a 1% increase in soil organic matter on one acre of land, just one acre of land has the water holding capacity of, you know, 16,000 to 20,000 gallons of water per acre in the top six to, you know, 12 inches. So if you've got three to 4% soil organic matter level, that's three to four times that 16 to 20,000 gallons per acre that you're able to hold as it rains. So by year eight, when we had that um, 24 inch rain event, we were able to sequester and hold over 140 million gallons of water. And see, that's never been something anyone in the county that I'm aware of has ever seen as a, as a, as a goal. So when they, in that, then all the water has run off their farms and created big ruts, taken soil with it, all types of you know, synthetic and organic you know, fertilizers, humus right out to the ocean and caused a whole uh, ton more problems. There's been an amazing, you know, sort of like, wow, this worked from us. We actually, I didn't know if it was going to work. We didn't know what the benefit was gonna to be to cover crop, all the different benefits. But like to, to be in Southern California and not have that be encouraged and taught in a way that can be adopted with uh, and embraced with enthusiasm um, is, is really kind of the missed opportunity with when you look at how much rain hit just our 200 acres in one year. You know, what is it like 27,158 gallons of water per inch, right, on one acre every time it rains an inch. And when you start looking at, uh, around at the, the amount of waste that we have with water, just in our inability to capture it in healthy soils, you can see where we pretty much could have made up uh, like 75% of our water budget over the last 40 years, every time it rained. Yeah, and so I think it's, I, I'm really interested in all of your experience with, with cover crops. That's an area of of research that I've been going in, especially with the, with almond orchards and and um, the tree nut crops that are up here. And um, actually, I was just sort of on a, a field trip last weekend, and I met with a bunch of of almond growers that are using cover crops in their orchards. And one of them, uh, who is not an organic farmer, but she uses cover crops. Uh, said that she turns on her, like she doesn't have to irrigate until probably two or three weeks after her neighbors who don't have cover crops um, start irrigating. And so that to me was really like, we still haven't shown other than like anecdotal evidence um, that these cover crops actually do benefit you know, almond orchards or whatever orchards um, and, and have this water holding capacity. Um, but a lot of growers are scared to plant cover crops because they have to maybe irrigate them to get them started, or they think that it's taking away water from their orchards. And that's really, I think what we're finding is that's really not the case. And so with, with a lot of, you know, droughts that are reoccurring, I think it's important for our growers in California and, and other areas as well, but especially here to, to be very, um, you know, open to cover crops. And it doesn't have to be a planted one. It can be weeds um, that are just, you know, the native plants that are growing. Um, and they really do have, have a, a big benefit on the soil. Another almond grower that I was talking with, these growers were around the Modesto area. Um, they have been planting cover crops but mostly just letting the weeds grow for, for a couple of years now. And over the period of one year, they increased their organic matter by 0.5%. So that's, it, I mean, it's just, it's, it's definitely something that we need to be considering. And um, I think it will really help with, with some of these problems with you know, lack of water and everything. Yeah, that's great. That was really helpful to hear that too. All right, um, so we have a lot of other questions. So we're gonna try to do this rapid fire style. Okay. Um, so just try to keep it short and brief. These are like questions. Can we type an answer some of these too? Is that possible? Is that... 
Yeah, yeah. I'm happy, you can... to, I'm happy to go through at some point too and type an answer if the session's still open, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so how important is manure as fertilizer? It's, it's primo, man. It's the, it's the most, to us, it's the, it's the holy grail. You know, you're, um, you're letting the, 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 the microorganisms of the rumen um, sort of advance the breakdown process, you know, to make it um, more bioavailable to the soil system to then break down again. Um, you're adding more microbes from the, even from the rumen process uh, back into the soil. Um, you're intensifying the whole thing, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it's becomes a closed loop in the shape of an eight, you know, the X being the soil part of that eight, you got birth phase, death phase, and it goes through the X and that's the decomposition phase and comes back around. That's the reanimation phase. And the cows kind of help advance that loop and make it a little bit more, more efficient. Um, you know, that's, that's at least uh, been my experience is we've used horse manure in certain areas um, because we didn't have enough cows in the beginning. And there's a huge difference in terms of what we've seen in soil health, tree health, even uh, flavor profiles of food. Um, the more we increased, uh, you know, ruminant manure like uh, specifically, you know, cows um, in the composting process. And of course, you know, vermicompost would be, I would say, maybe even a touch above the, the cow itself, right? Um, which is a, a huge part of our program as well. Yeah, and another quick one. Uh, thoughts on- Sorry, that wasn't quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that was good though. Um, thoughts on monarch butter butterflies and their contribution on our ecosystem? I don't know the specific. Do you know, Brittany, the specific contribution? No, no, I don't. I know they're pretty know. and yeah. they probably pollinate things. I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they are. I know they are specific pollinators to certain plants um, and maybe a keystone species to those plant, those specific plants. Um, we, we have a lot of um, native milkweed on the farm and have watched the numbers kind of go down. This year, they're actually up a little bit here, but down everywhere else. Um, not necessarily an indication of anything. Uh, we know that they're in trouble. Um, and I think plant planting the right kind of milkweed is really important and people are learning that there is a right kind. You want it to actually be the kind that grows and it peaks at the right season so that it doesn't throw off their migratory cycle. I have learned, I have learned that. People are interested in knowing where they can find organic topsoil or organic corn seeds. I, I would call your local extension agent. Um, maybe Brittany has. Yeah, that's that's also what I would say. Um, yeah. Or if you know any, yeah, local organic growers, maybe they would know as well. And organic corn seeds, if they if they email. Uh, info at apricotlanefarms.com and ask that question. They'll direct them to um, Steve in the garden, who I know is probably, he's probably sourced some corn seeds. People want to know best sort of practices for composting when it comes to fruit trees. Like applying the compost um, or? Just like, I have a question here is like best technique for fruit residue composting and somebody's like best mulch and compost practices for the home grower of fruit trees. Okay, so what I have learned about cover crop and fruit trees, what we have learned here um, is that our cover crops in some areas did get so out of control and get right up against the, the base of the tree. And it was a very slow process, but it stunted the trees. And then once we pulled that back like three feet at the most, maybe like two, just away from the tree, pulled that cover crop away from the tree, um, the tree health improved immediately. Leaf size got bigger um, and the trees actually grew uh, almost like right in front of our eyes. The next level, so you pull the, you pull the, um, uh, the, some, the grasses away from the tree, like I say, like let's say a foot and a half, two feet. And then we, we consistently, when we have the mulch, we apply mulch mixed with a compost. Um, and then you get essentially a beautiful little mini worm farm around every tree. We also have installed um, drip around all of our trees. So we switch between sprinklers and drip depending on the time of year. Um, we'll grow our cover crops from spring into like the beginning of summer. And sometimes with especially stone fruit, we'll turn the, 
the top sprinklers off to reduce the um, uh, fungal issues uh, in the canopy um, and then go to drip, but you end up with this really amazing little uh, ecosystem around every uh, fruit tree. And that's honestly been a recent thing that we've just gotten through. Um, and we'll throw a scoop of compost sometimes right on the ground, the bare ground before we put the mulch on top. Is it hard to sell what you grow? How do you get started? Well, you know what's, what, what makes it easier to sell what you grow when it's really good? And that's where you say, and I've, Brittany knows this, like everybody's trying to prove whether this work or that works, but the proof is in the food and the flavor, you know? And when people can taste the difference, they're like, why does this avocado taste? When someone says, why does the cauliflower taste so good? I'm like, cauliflower just doesn't have a taste. It's a, it's a, it's a vehicle for butter. You know, but man, when you taste cauliflower that's actually been grown in really healthy, mineral rich soil, that's what sells the food. And man, it gets around. And so, you know what we did in the beginning when we thought we had something special, we got chefs involved and we would get the chef to come out and taste it and they start selling it. We actually now hardly sell it at uh, many restaurants because we have such a good direct sales market that it, by the time the chefs get to it, the consumers have purchased most of it. And you kind of want that because chefs will buy like 12 avocados. They won't buy like 150, you know? Um, so, so it's really the, it's, 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 it's focus on the flavor, you know, focus on the flavor, but focus on the soil first. And that will, that'll get you there in, in my opinion. All right. So we're getting to the end of the hour here. I just want to say to the people that are interested in composting or like doing any sort of volunteering work uh, that we're going to give some resources at the end here, including this um, uh, sort of like handout that includes a lot of resources over here that you guys can use. Um, and yeah, I'd just like to thank the panelists for coming and if there's anything else that you guys would like to add at the end, like, please, please do so. Oh, and before I forget, uh, yeah, we're going to send this out in an email, uh, in, including with the exit poll uh, uh, to the pe people who registered to the email that you registered with. Yeah, I mean, thanks for, for having me on. It was great to be here and, um, and talk with you, John. When I watched the film, I spent like at least half a day trying to justify quitting my job and starting a farm. So <laughs> then I realized I'm an economist and that wouldn't be a good use of my time, but um, it was it was really awesome. And I'm glad that we got to talk more about um, your farm. Well, that thanks Brittany, I appreciate it. I'm, I really appreciate you being here today um, as well. And um, you know, don't give up on that, on that dream. Um, crazier things have happened. <laughs> um, I, I think like in closing, I think there's, um, I'll say this, I, I think that a lot of us carry a, a tremendous amount of anxiety um, and, and fear around what's happening, um, depending on what it is, uh, food scarcity, um, you know, disadvantaged communities not being able to have access to this food, um, the climate crisis, the water crisis within the climate crisis, there's all these reasons to, to be, I think, fearful. And, and I think what we've learned um, in the 10 years that was kind of a surprise to me was that after about eight years, the anxiety of what I felt that was induced by the fear of every failure um, went away the more I realized that the, an the antidote was, was, was curiosity. And, and, and just like leaning into the problem and not necessarily being so focused on solving the problem, but really trying to understand all the levers that, that, that sort of give that problem fuel and prevent that problem from being solved. And then it starts to kind of get fun and, and the world seems less scary, you know? And the anxiety that we all feel is that we, we, we think that our job as humans, especially conscious, you know, well-intended, good-hearted human beings, that are aware of the, 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 the disadvantages that the environment has over the human sort of decisions around it and uh, uh, communities that can't afford this way of food. We think that our job is to fix it all right now. And I, I, all I ask is that we remember that it's the little pieces we put in place while each of us are here that actually build on the solution. 
and, and I'll give you this kind of like statistic, at least from my, this is a statistic or a no, numbers that I sort of realized that it took us 260 years, like I said, to get into this, into this problem, you know, since the beginning of the industrial revolution. And we, we got here unconscious of the consequences. And it, it took Molly and I um, and many other farmers in the regenerative space who inherited land that had been extractively farmed a, sh a far shorter period to return the health of the system to even better than what it was than it did to unconsciously destroy it. So in that I say, one is to be patient, but even within that, at least acknowledging the roles and the impacts that we play and the little steps that we make begin to show the resiliency in things, the resiliency in communities to wanna actually lean in and grow this food in an urban environment, the resiliency in a politician to actually stick it through and listen a little bit longer to understand what the words regenerative agriculture actually really mean. And for that grandfather or grandmother that drinks Coca-Cola to actually kind of wake up to this idea that maybe they can change everything by just the choices they make around food. But we have to be patient. And we have to remember that it's, it is truly a patchwork quilt that's going to fix this. It's not going to be one farming method and one giant form of agriculture that solves it all. And so therefore we are as individuals enough if we just focus on what's right in front of us because that is incredibly inspiring to other people. And that type of infection is something that we should be focused on right now than all the other ones that we hear about on the news all the time. Be the infectious person of change and you only have to do a little part to prove that it's enough. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for coming, Brittany and John. I'd just like to give a final reminder uh, that the exit poll will uh, come up like as soon as the event is over. So if you could please fill that out and uh, please uh, check out our future events. This is the first of hopefully many. And thank you so much.